My name is Hannes Kühlmann. I'm part of the SUSE product management. One of the products I'm responsible for is live patching, and with me is Wojtek. Hello. Wojtek Pavli, director of the Lunch, the department where I actually develop live patching. So, I take uh, like 30 minutes, 25 minutes for the first part of the presentation, then Wojtek jumps in with some of the technical stuff. Because if I present it, he will correct me all time. So it, I think it's better if he presents that. <laughs> and then he gives it back to me for, um, for the vouchers here. So solving the paradox, who thinks enterprise life patching roadmap. Again, this presentation doesn't come with lots of code. There's basically not much code in here. There's more like we go one level up, more like on a conceptual level, high level, to talk about life patching and actually why we think it's a good idea to do that. Here are a couple of examples that may sound familiar to you. The first one is hosting providers scheduling downtime for 9 p.m., which is a good time for downtime because usually the business hours are from morning till afternoon. But apparently the downtime of this hosting provider affected a streaming service, which has actually a lot of customers running the servers at 9 p.m. So not a good thing. And basically, if you schedule downtime, someone will be hit, someone. So you cannot really avoid that. Another example, there was a CVE of kernel vulnerability. It's a hosting service for developers that was affected where developers can upload their code and let it host their web application. They make money with that. It's their business. I mean, those are small companies using services of an, another company for hosting. If this company has a downtime of one, two, three hours, not really good. Or, this <laughs> is my favorite, about an online game, the online game developer said, okay, there's, there's an update of the game happening, so while I do the game update, let's do some maintenance as well and update a couple of other packages. And then it's like, ah, it first update, it didn't work that well, we need more time, update two, ah, the issue is probably a little bit severe, and then the fourth update, ah, it's all harder than we wished. So there are coming things together which you don't have under control. So, let's start with the downtime twist. On the left side here, I have planned downtime and a couple of characteristics for planned downtime. So, it has a regular cadence, be it monthly, quarterly, yearly, usually happening on the weekend, of course, because you don't want to interrupt your business hours. It's in alignment with all the stakeholders. All the stakeholders are aligned. Everyone knows downtime is coming, all good. You usually do a combination of tasks because you may want to change broken hard disks, you want to may do some stuff on the AC cooling units and maintenance, getting new servers in, changing cables, updating software. So usually, because you have the entire weekend. And there are some technologies from SUSE, like SUSE Manager, how you can, opt with, with those you can optimize that. For example, the uh, time needed for installing updates, as we see in the keynote, you just press a couple of buttons and then everything runs automatically. So question for you, unplanned downtime. What is the cadence of unplanned downtime? No. <laughs> None? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah, there is no cadence of unplanned downtime. It just happens. So, and when does unplanned downtime happen? Is it on a weekend? No. Oh, it's on Christmas Day usually. <laughs> then when you you need the systems up and running because the the husbands need to buy the last time <laughs> the the last Christmas presents they forgot apparently, and then there's downtime. That's that's really bad because even if, if the cartridge isn't working or Amazon isn't working, it's not really good. What about alignment? Yeah, of course, it's basically no alignment stakeholders. Maybe one stakeholders aligned, maybe two. But you're basically hit by like, oh my god, unplanned downtime. It's like, you want to do the travel expenses, you, you, <laughs> you pile all the travel expenses up there and say, okay, now I do travel expenses, you start going into the system, downtime. That's what happened to me last time. So, of course, you only fix one particular problem causing the unplanned downtime. If it's a kernel bug, you need to update the kernel. If it's a hardware failure, because whatever, you don't have enough rate disks configured or so, if a network cable is burned, whatever, only one thing is fixed because 
Um, again, it doesn't happen on the weekend. Nobody is aligned. You need to fix those as soon as possible. And there are a couple of technologies to optimize that. I mean, to avoid basically unplanned downtime. Can you name a few? Anyone who knows a couple of technologies? I just named also some. Rate, for example, rate systems. Anything else comes to your mind? Hmm? Cluster, yes. I've listed a couple here, like uninterrupted power supplies, rate systems, load balancer if the application supports it. Uh, with the rust features in the hardware itself, like right, reliability, availability, serviceability. That's that are the features where the, the components on the main board, like the CPU and the memory, instead of just breaking and doing fault calculations, let the operating system know I'm broken. Please take me off the scheduling, like what Unix had. Uh, the Unix servers had in the past also available now in the servers. System rollback is one thing. We have a slash 12, a sputter FS. Something is messed up. You can actually roll back to the last known state, continue working through the root cause analysis later on. HA and GU. Virtualization, for example, for example, using VM reds. Um, is it fault tolerance? I think it's fault tolerance. Uh, you have copies of two VMs running, one a shadow, and then one system fails and operations continue in another VM. And a question mark. Of course, you might have guessed that's live patching. But before we put live patching into that box, does any of those technologies help you with avoiding downtime when there's a security fix that needs to be applied? Not really. I mean, with a load balancer, you can start patching one system, taking off the load balancers, and do that sequentially through the system. But basically, none of those technologies help the security fixes. But on the other hand, you don't want to have downtime because of important systems should run. So, again, the quiz. So, who will win? The security guys telling you need to fix the system, or you who says, no, I don't want to stop the system because I want to make my users happy? Obviously, security folks usually win. Sometimes, <laughs> maybe the operation folks win, but it's common sense because there are laws and regu regulations, for example, the PCI DSS, when you process in your system credit card information, you have to patch a certain vulnerability when it is known within two weeks. If you didn't patch it until then, you're not allowed to process credit card information any further. Okay. If you have a web shop, I mean, that's a, quite a bummer, if you ask me. So security always wins. Uh, Looking at security, I mean, this, this slide is outdated because, like, what's two weeks ago, uh, email provider in the US has been, was the security leak, 500 million email addresses leaked, passwords, addresses. There are security flaws in software, and there are people, organizations that exploit that. There were 75 data, maybe it's now 80 or 90, didn't update the slide recently, where more than 1 million data sets are stolen. Those data sets are credit card information, social security numbers, email addresses, all of that information. You don't want to have within a database sitting in a, at a group, you really don't, don't trust or don't know. The more pressing question for me actually is, what about the non-disclosed one? Those are maybe 80 were disclosed because the company had to disclose those. But how many were not disclosed? A lot. I don't know the number, but but you just go public and say, oh yeah, we had a major security breach. That's so awesome. Want to be our customer again? No. So looking at security flaws, because again, security is the one thing which makes it really hard to have no downtime. The three takeaways on this slide that I would like you to remember. First, on the top left, on the top, the number of security flaws are increasing. That's statistics. Data comes from the National Vulnerability Database. Last year, I predicted for 2015, 8,500. We ended up with 8,800 security flaws found in the software. Why is that? I mean, each company nowadays runs software. I mean, you had typewriters in the past, now software is everywhere. Each company needs to be a software company, software defined everything. There's more software around, more software means more bugs, more, more attack vectors. Second, more people 
write code. The average OpenStack developer was developing OpenStack for six, op the average, no, the other way around. If you take an OpenStack developer last year, last year, 48% of those were developing OpenStack for more than six years. So this, like half of those developers were quite seasoned in developing OpenStack, 48%. This year, this number decreased 40%. Why is that, that those just guys just vanished? No, but they were flooded with lots of new folks starting development because OpenStack is so high, maybe they have an opportunity there to learn and so on. The number of developers increased and from the percentage level, the experienced developers were now at 40% and not 48 any longer. Which means lots of rookies join the software business. And you cannot expect a rookie to know all of those details about security. They just write code. And this is also one of the factors nowadays why there are more bugs in the software. You cannot test everything. Second fact, or the second thing I would like you to remember is where the, the vulnerability types, in which area they are found. Operating system, browsers, mobile devices and applications themselves. And we are now focusing on the operating system side and you see still the operating system is a good attack vector. Why? If you have control over the operating system, you should usually have control over the application as well. Simple as that. And the third thing on the on the ranking, obviously Apple is top because why is Apple top and Microsoft? Not because they write bad software, because peop, lots of people using those use those software. Lots of inexperienced people from technology perspective use Apple devices, like my, my dad, my wife, they all use Apple devices. They don't have any clue about IP tables and security. It just works, which makes this a perfectly, a perfect attack vector. Because, I mean, you know those, I love you virus, you click on the attachment, boom. The Linux kernel is still listed here. Place 11, the 77 vulnerabilities in 2015. That's still a lot, 77. Those are either high, medium, or low, and we come back to that number of 77. So vulnerabilities are increasing over time. Like a little more than one third is on the operating system, and of course the Linux kernel is also being attacked. So how does actually data center operations look today? You take a Linux kernel and I just take arbitrary dates here. It doesn't matter if this is a Linux kernel from SUSE or from Red Hat, from Canonical, if it's upstream or if it's Gentoo or your Linux from scratch. It really doesn't matter. You take a kernel and when the vendor releases the kernel, the vendor thinks the kernel is super secure because it passed everything and inside the QA, all good. What happens over time? Security flaws are found, CVEs were published. So for, for the ones of you who are not familiar with CVEs, CVE is actually a naming scheme that is used to name vulnerabilities and the National Vulnerability Database, the NVD uses this scheme to give a vulnerability a, a number. It's then CVE-year-4-digit number and probably next year they have to use a 5-digit number because we're already close to 9,000. So, Vulnerabilities in the system, what do you do? You patch the system, meaning you install a new Linux kernel and you have to reboot. And actually, this all we had that happened then on December 11th. So just four weeks, four weeks, you run a, a state-of-the-art Linux kernel, and four weeks later you have to reboot into a new Linux kernel if you want to get rid of those vulnerabilities. And guess what? I mean, the hackers are not dormant, they are active. So you see, you reboot again in January, more CVEs found, and obviously those CVEs found in new kernels are also found in the older kernels. You reboot on February 10th, March 22nd, June 9th. Oh, there was a large gap, maybe they were on vacation. August 16th, September 12th. And the sample data I took was, was in September. So if your Linux kernel, the, you run in your, in your data center older than, let's say, eight months, you have 24 vulnerabilities in that kernel. And those are just the ones rated high, which means with a score of six or higher. So those are the ones where the security department writes a small piece of paper, say fix it, and gives that to the 
IT administrator or at least the IT director of, of, of operations. How long do you run a Linux kernel? <laughs> okay, it's, it's a trade secret, okay? Nobody needs, needs to reveal that. It's just like this, this is happening and, you know, I mean, the vulnerabilities, like the flaws where data was stolen, comes from those sources. And why is the kernel such a good thing to attack? I mean, if you have the kernel, you have kernel space, you basically have user space, and you have everything else on the server. Mm -hmm. So anything you impl um, implement on the server, like SE Linux or some firewalls or so, good luck with that, if the kernel is compromised. And actually, that, that picture <laughs> reminds me of a Dilbert from uh, 2010. <laughs> so it, it looks like, I mean, you know that from a desktop, and, and on a server it isn't any different. You reboot and, oh, bing, you have a new update to install. Quick thing about the CVEs on the, on the list. I mean, I, I told you those are a severity of six or higher, but what's, what does that mean, a severe severity of six or higher? What are those, actually, those flaws about? Mainly about den causing denial of service, so bringing down your server, not with like IP cameras sending things, but just like an exploit in the server is done. You can and you bypass access restrictions, so those two categories mostly. So any access restrictions we have implemented can be bypassed, user can become root, that's not good. And then denial of service, mostly. And you don't want to have those, like 24 of those attack vectors available in your Linux system, on your Linux server. And the question, of course, is, I mean, we can, can't we patch software while it runs? And I think flying to the moon is a little bit more complicated than patching software while it runs. That's like, but I think Wojtek can tell you a little bit more about that. Again, live patching would be the answer now for that. We fill the last hexagon. And now I would hand over to Wojtyk. Right. Yes. You said the slides so are okay, actually, so yeah. I, I forward the slides. Live patching is almost as old as flying, flying to the moon. And the, the first documented instance of live patching is actually from the Trinity project of Los Alamos. Uh, still with punch cards, you can see there. Um, the, the situation they had was they, they only, uh, only had a month before uh, the Trinity nuclear device was supposed to be exploded and they had no idea what the yield will be, whether it will just fizzle or whether it will destroy an area of a couple hundred square kilometer. So they needed to compute that and normally uh, that calculation would take three months, which is like three times more time than, than they have. Than they had because the IBM calculators that were using the punch cards were constantly producing errors while punching and or while calculating. So what happened is that the team actually figured out a way how to use punch cards of multiple colors. And when a calculation error was there, they would run the recalculate on another machine and plug it into the data set again. So in, in the end, there was like a dozen different colors of punch cards circulating through those machines and they succeeded in calculating it just in time. So, thanks. Um, in the academia, uh, live patching is called DSU, dynamic software updates. Um, it's just a different term for the same thing. Um, the first attempts that uh, have been there were starting in the 90s with POTUS uh, and all those technologies try different approaches at life patching. Um, for example, one interesting is Amline, uh, which is actually still in use today, is the first commercial life patching technology. It's a, it relies on a uh, custom language. It's not for C, it's, the, the Erlang is actually a language that has life patching implemented into it. It can replace simply functions because it has a table of all functions and when you replace it, it just changes the pointer in the table. Um, now, the first one to patch the Linux kernel was Spaceflight, they don't at MIT, later acquired by Oracle, um, which is using a specific technology to patch the kernel and that is, what it basically does is it stops the kernel. Uh, 
you have what the next line is? Just that I'm not looking too much ahead. Okay. Uh, it stops the whole kernel, and then before it starts patching, so it stops every single CPU in the system, even those that are running uh, running applications, those that are running kernel, and everything. Everything is roughly a complete hold. Uh, and then uh, case price uh, checks uh, whether any of those CPUs are executing any of the code that needs to be patched. And executing doesn't mean that doesn't only mean that the instruction pointer is actually pointing at those instructions, but also that any instructions from that area may be on stack. So a function may be returning to that place after it's been patched, which would also cause a crash. So it goes through all the stacks of all the kernel uh, threads of all the processes that are executing inside of the kernel. And if any of them is executing in that range that needs to be patched, well, it gives up. It waits a while, or well, actually it starts the kernel again, starts the system again, it keeps running, waits a while, stops it again, and checks again until it's lucky and actually finds a moment where all those uh, processes are outside of the area to be patched. For many cases, this will actually happen on the first try. For some, it will never happen. The result is that uh, the average time while how the system is being stopped is 40 milliseconds, which doesn't sound like much, but in certain applications, maybe uh, basically an eternity. 40 milliseconds in a real time, whatever industrial control system is a lot. You don't want a 40, 40 milliseconds delay in your uh, whatever self driving car, for example. That would be quite bad. So, uh, then in 2014, basically at the same time, uh, both Suzanne and Hat announced their solutions. Uh, K patch and KGraph. Um, KGraph is the Suzanne one. KPatch is basically based uh, on, uh, on KSplice, and I will talk a little bit about how KGraph works. So, the main magic is in how KGraph replaces functions. So, basically, when you want a fix, a fix means taking the old function, throwing it away, replacing it with a new function that has the fix included in the kernel, and doing that in a way that doesn't require stopping the kernel because we don't want those 40 milliseconds of delay. So the way it's done um, is relying on the ftrace infrastructure that was originally intended and built for tracing the kernel. So the ftrace <laughs> sorry, infrastructure does uh, a clever thing that it places a no-op instruction a five byte large no-op instruction at the beginning of every function using some GCC parameter. That under normal circumstances is simply doing nothing. And it's not even costing any CPU cycles because all modern CPUs actually discard that right in the uh, instruction decoder. So it's not even hitting the instruction pipeline. Now, when we want to, want to patch, uh, there is an atomic way and I will not go into that because it's another four, 15 minutes on how to do that. Uh, to replace the no op into a call instruction. That in, then, then calls into the f infrastructure, which calls into KGraph infrastructure. KGraph decides that this function is the one that's supposed to be patched. And f instead of returning back to the call site, actually changes the stack and returns to the new function. So instead of the old function being executed, the new function is now executed. And that's how you replace the function effectively. This takes an additional overhead. We went through a couple more subsystems there instead of just a simple simple call, mm -hmm. which is evaluated at approximately 70 nanoseconds. So that's a very, very short time per, per function call. Now, this is not just as easy as I described it, unfortunately. Uh, there is a lot of issues that a developer or when we were developing it, we ran into. Um, one is 
the GCC optimizations, either in uh, function inlining or IPA SRA, um, are optimizations that the compiler does to make code faster. But it is it is doing a lot of transformations on the code. So in the end, when you look at the compiler code, it doesn't look very much like the one that you wrote. It just is functionally equivalent. So for example, inlining. Okay, inlining is a very simple concept where if you have a small function that is where the overhead of calling it actually is larger than if you just included the function into every place where it's supposed to be called, uh, then the compiler does just that. It copies the function instead of calling it. Now, if that function had a bug, suddenly there is a bug in every of those functions where it was copied to. So it's not about just replacing that single function in the kernel, because if you replace it, okay, it's fixed, but nobody was calling it, everybody was including it, 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 it directly. So you need to replace all the other functions in, in the kernel that were including this one. And to figure that out, you can use either the dwarf information, or now we also have a modified compiler that can actually spit out all the information about what optimization is doing. Or the third way to do it is actually by comparing the resulting assembly before and after patching, which is also a tool that we designed. So all that actually goes into the process of creating a live patch. Now, um, another pitfall is static symbols. So the kernel has exported symbols that are available for use by modules. And since a live patch is a module, it is happy to use those. But there is a number of static symbols that are not available for modules that are only always available only inside a specific object. But when you are replacing a function that was referencing those static symbols because it was living in that object, the new function that is coming from outside can't see them. So uh, the light patching solution is using KO things or uh, now generalize to actually get at those, uh, th th those static symbols and link with them. Uh, yeah. I mentioned the last thing, perhaps, and skip the rest because it's, it's, it's all getting a little bit too involved, and that's eternal sleepers. So that is a problem for both kpatch and kdrop, and actually for the point. Those are processes that call into the kernel, and for example, call a read on a TTY. Let's say TTY7, there is a Getty running on that, waiting for login, for a login that never happens, because the sysadmin doesn't simply use TTY7 ever. But that process <laughs> is actually running, or is sleeping, and it's sleeping within the read syscall, and that means that it's sleeping inside of the kernel. Now you want to patch that read syscall of the TTY for whatever reason, and you can't because there is a process that is actually sleeping right there. And regardless of uh, whether that is kpatch or kgraft, um, that location cannot be patched. Well, actually, it can be patched for kgraft, uh, thanks to the ftrace thingy. But um, there is a consistency model that says that we shouldn't do that, because uh, if we are patching multiple functions concurrently, then uh, we would have an inconsistency. So what kgraft does, is for normal processes, they just, if they are running, if they are doing something, they will never spend a lot of time in one location. So as soon as they are out, it actually does the patching, uh, it switches uh, uh, the, the old function for the new function, and it's, and it's fine for that specific process. For the processes that sleep for too long, it sends them a signal, a specific diversity k graph, which normally doesn't exist. It's a, a very specific signal that wakes the process up, forces it to exit the kernel functions, and then at the kernel user space boundary, it's actually serviced by the kernel itself and never reaches the user space. So the user space process never sees it, and it just makes a loop to the end of the kernel and back with the decreasing function, and uh, it's patched me in between. Okay, consistency. Consistency is uh, a specific concept in life function. Uh, what I described before with ftrace, with the switching of, of that no-op instruction into a call instruction, is 
allowing you to replace a single function in the kernel at a time. So you, you change one, you change another, and that works. Now the problem is, if you have two functions that, for example, call each other, and the number of parameters change between those because you need to, need to add another parameter to fix a security issue. Now you can't actually use the, let's say, three parameter call to call a four parameter function or vice versa. So you have to switch those two functions at exactly the same time such that always when you have one function calling the other, it would use the correct API. If you do one first and the other second, there is a window where there would be a problem. Now, Ksplice and Kpash fix that by simply stopping the kernel such that nobody can be executing, then switch the two functions, and then when the kernel resumes, they are switched. But we don't want to stop the kernel. We want to do it uh, fully on the fly. So the way it's done is actually we keep a per process flag, whether the process should be seeing the old functions or the new functions. We, and we keep both copies in memory in the system. And for every call that happens to one of those functions we are changing, we take a look at that flag of that process and say, okay, are you already ready to see the new functions or not? And that flag is set to one, meaning ready, when the, kernel ex well, when the process exits the kernel, okay? So, I described what kpatch and ksplice do. Now, for kgraph, what we do is for each thread, we wait until that thread leaves the kernel, then set the flag to one. So that means that if the thread is still in the kernel, it hasn't exited yet, it will keep seeing the old functions. It, it, will, it will return from a function where it slept to the parent and to the parent, and those were, will all be the pre patch version. So the number of parameters will fit, will match, the semantics will match, and everything will be fine. Then it exits the kernel completely, so there is no more dependencies. And then when it enters the kernel again, it will start seeing the new, uh, new version of the function. So that's how we achieve the same level of consistency as kpatch and ksplice, but without the cost of the latency. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know about that one. Yeah. So yes, um, <laughs> if you think we could solve it better, or if you just would like to work on that, we have positions open. So now there is a project that is called KLP, uh, which is a joint project of the Hab and SUSE to somehow unify. Uh, KGraph and KPatch together into a solution that can be included upstream so that we don't have to maintain two separate solutions. Uh, and it's taking a while to actually bring it up to the capabilities of either KPatch or KGraph. So what is today in upstream and what actually one of our competitors is started using and announced publicly is a very trimmed down version that does only the very basic, it doesn't have a consistency model at all, so it can only patch single functions. Uh, and that, that we have managed together with Red Hat already get upstream. But there are parts that KGraph relies on and KPatch relies on that actually are a little bit more involved cleanups of the kernel. So uh, KPatch to work and to be able to stack, to check the stacks needs a reliable stack unwinder to be able to see what is on the stack. And stack unwinding in the kernel has not been reliable for the last 10 years. So Josh Pombiff from Red Hat is actively working on fixing that up, particularly in the assembly code, which doesn't, uh, doesn't follow proper uh, stack frame conventions, unfortunately. Now there is a stack checker that actually checks whether all the code in the kernel is handling the stack correctly. But that's still not enough uh, for us to use that technology uh, because it relies on the stack frame, a stack frame pointer. So that's a specific register. The BP register is used always to point at the previous stack frame in the stack. 
and the use of the register, the additional saving of the content of that register for each call actually can cost up to 10% of kernel performance. Mind you, 10% of kernel performance doesn't mean 10% of application performance. It's just the execution speed of the actual kernel. On normal systems, if your kernel is using more than 1% of the overall CPU, then that's quite a lot. So 10% of that 1% is not very much. It's, uh, but still, it's, it's something that we at SUSE don't want to have. We want to have the kernel running fast. So uh, for that, we need to actually have a full dwarf unwinder. That's something we are working on together with Josh. Once that's done, we can use the stack on wire. For Kva uh, to work with the consistency model that does the per thread migration, we need a kernel thread cleanup. Because today, uh, what we have in the SUSE kernel, we have annotated every kernel thread with uh, <coughs> a safe point. Because kernel threads never exit the kernel, actually. Like normal threads, they do exit the kernel, but kernel threads don't. So we have to add a specific command to each kernel thread saying, okay, at this point, I am basically like exiting the kernel. I'm not referencing any previous data, or, and I am at the bottom of the stack. So that is obviously not acceptable upstream because annotating every single kernel threads where, well, there is basically one kernel thread added per day in the upstream kernel. Um, doesn't uh, really scale. So what we are doing is we are cleaning up the whole kernel thread infrastructure to make sure that all these annotations, and it's not just live patching, it's also freezing for uh, system uh, suspend and resume, uh, that's parking for uh, CPU hot plug and unplug, and so on. There is a lot of annotation in those threads, and it's getting ugly. So we have decided to do uh, and put the effort in to clean that up in the, in, in the upstream kernel such that all of these functionalities can be easily plugged in into just a single place. That is already merged as of like two weeks ago, I think, which is like, hooray, finally, after a year. Uh, and now we are in the process of actually converting individual threads to, to this new infrastructure. So when those two are in place, the goal is to start such a, a so-called hybrid model that combines the best of KPatch and KCraft and actually can speed the patching even more up. So, that's from the open source side. Okay, uh, how about other architectures? Um, Part 64 done. Uh, actually, did we skip? Yeah, that's yours already. Yeah, that's already. Okay, so Part 64 is is the latest edition, but uh, the mainframe is already working for quite a while, actually. We have support for our uh, fetching on the mainframe already in the SLE 12 GA kernel, but we didn't tell anybody yet. Uh, and we are just, uh, just waiting for demand on that one. Uh, and ARM64 is also in the works. So that will take a couple more months, I think, because the uh, ARM64 API is a little bit convoluted and PowerPC64 was as well, because uh, it is just using things like talk pointers and so on, which don't lend themselves easily to live patching, but we will solve it. Definitely. Back to you. Thank you, Wojtek. So having, having seen this heavy technology stuff, now it's getting a little bit easier now, <laughs> hopefully. So if we run the SUSE data center now with live patching, how would that kernel story with all those CVEs that are found look like? I mean, of course, we, the CVEs are still found in the kernel. So you install a kernel, it's state of the art, couple of days, weeks pass, security advisory say, okay, stuff in there, bad stuff in the kernel, you need to update. However, if you have live patching, you have two options now. You can, of course, still reboot because you really like to reboot your service. You can do that. Or you can install a live patch on that particular kernel in order to fix those security flaws. Okay, you can let the kernel run. No need to reboot. I mean, if you have 10,000 servers, I don't want to reboot those every other month just to install a kernel. And the story just continues. I mean, yes, a new vulnerability is found. Patches are made available. Of course, always the option to reboot. If you have a maintenance Windows get, you can use that to just 
get the current to a new level. But in the SUSE data set, and this is what we use also SUSE internally, yeah? we don't need to reboot that many often anymore because of those fix those those vulnerabilities. Because all of those are fixed by light patching. And this is the service. So Wojtek talked about the technology. The technology is one piece of it. And we have actually, there are companies out there that take KGraph, take that, put it onto another distribution, let's say maybe Debian, and provide the service for Debian. I mean, they can do that. Fine. It's open source software. They can provide the services. The software itself is open source. But there's a service on top of that that provides you the convenience of not having to reboot. And this is a very important thing because the other block from that other Linux distribution where they have uh, that kpatch clone, they just take what is there, provide some patches for simple functions and give that to the community, not the community, but their customers. But I have a better feeling if the company providing those patches knows the technology and actually is developed the developing the technology. This is like the, I mean, if someone knows that stuff, it's us, or at least for KPatch, it would be right at that. Very important to keep in mind because this is not really something that's, it's not a surgery on open heart, but you need to have the skills for that. Again, yeah, Boitish talked about this inlining and WARF and the GCC optimizations, looking at the sampler. There aren't many people that just look at the sampler and say, yeah, there's the bug, let's fix it. It's, it's not that easy. And again, it's a service that we provide. Can we guarantee you that we provide a fix? No, because we don't know if there's a security vulnerability. I mean, there might be a time, let's see here, between let's see, mid of April and beginning of June, there were no security flaws. There's no reason to provide fixes. I mean, it's, it's good if there are no flaws, no fixes needed. But if there are flaws, we provide the fixes. Uh, that's a marketing slide. I don't like that. So. <laughs> My product marketing manager is not in this room, so I can skip that slide easily. So there are four, four playing cards, and I, I reveal now one card after each other, giving you an, um, a situation, an example, and you need to let me know if this is a good candidate, a good environment for using live patching or not. Because I don't want to sell you stuff that you don't really need, because it really depends on the situation in your data center, <coughs> how you use the software, how important the software is, the entire scenario. So, the first candidate is the Mount Palomar telescope from NASA. Do you think that this is a good candidate for life patching? Anyone? Well, I would say it's using Linux Enterprise real time. Yes. To um, actually dynamically adjust the shape of the main mirror to uh, counteract an atmospheric deformation. Some nifty technology using lasers and stuff. I could talk about that for. An hour maybe. But we're in the live patching session. So is this a good candidate for, I mean for real time, yes. For live patching? No. They have downtime each day when the sun is shining. And labor isn't expensive during day. <laughs> so they can patch their system 10 days, uh, 10 hours each day. There's no, no need for live patching in this scenario. Unless you want to make up a challenge for your sales guy, I mean, you can let him <laughs> try that. But it's, again, not a good candidate. So, what about the next one? That's the Google Data Center. And it doesn't matter if it's the Google Data Center or like a server farm with like 10,000 servers. Is that a good candidate for live patching? Could be. Could be. I would say 50-50 depending on the application you run. In the example of Google, they run stateless applications like web servers and email servers. They can basically throw a half of half of the racks away and the service is still available. So th there's no basic need to update those systems all at once because of the stateless application nature, they can start doing those updates. They can even reboot those servers. It doesn't really matter because the application is stateless. But if you have a server farm with like 1,000, 10,000 virtual machines running a VMware environment using a third-party application from, a, from the old world like SAP, you just cannot simply do that. You need to have those 10,000 VMs on a, uh, on a bug-free kernel within two weeks latest. It takes a substantial amount of time, and that would be, of course, then a scenario for live patching. We'll just apply the patch. So, 
desktop, laptop? No, nah, no. Nah. Unless you are rendering the next Pixar movie on your on your high-end uh, laptop, you usually don't need that. But again, there are scenarios if you have rendering stuff happening on your workstation and you don't want to break that. Really corner scenario. But usually, yes, the desktop is not a good fit for that. And last but not least, just mentioned that already, SAP HANA. Um, if you have a system with 12 terabytes of memory, um, you reboot the server and then it takes the server like 45 minutes to just initialize the memory or maybe 20 minutes but that's like it's a lot but then the operating system is up and then when you start HANA you need to read those 12 terabyte from disk into memory so for the for the quick ones of you 12 terabytes when you have a subsystem of that can deliver 500 megabytes per second read how long would it take to read the 12 terabyte into memory? Seven hours. Seven. Of course, depending on your disk subsystem, you can bring it down maybe to one hour, but it's still, it's an hour and you have a freaking expensive subsystem then anyway. So this is something you don't want to ha have happening just before the next board meeting when the board members are pulling their analytic numbers from SAP HANA. Simply not. Again, live patching, it's a technology that makes a lot of sense for certain scenarios where you don't want to have interruption or the administrative overhead of updating an infrastructure is just too big, it's just too enormous to handle. And it's a case-by-case -case decision you need to make. And of course you can have only 10 servers of your data center being supplied with live patches and you have 1,000 not supplied because they're maybe not so important, also, also possible. So Outlook, Wojtek talked a little bit about that, live patching for PowerPC, IBM C systems and, and ARM. We have it all running in the labs, currently not available as a product. And why is that? It's just the effort we have, it's the service that we provide and we haven't seen the demand so far. Simple as that. We could do it, but just because the technology is there and you can, you can do it, if there's no business reason, why would you do that? So we're waiting for the demand and with SAP HANA on, on power, so little ending coming around the corner, that might be a, a business case for having live patching on, on PowerPC 64 little engine. C systems maybe, I've, I've heard customers that say, oh, we reboot a VM in 30 seconds, so we, we really don't care. But again, this is the demand that's not there. We have it on the, in the pipeline, it's on the roadmap, we just need customers asking for it. User space live patching is something pretty cool. Oracle announced that with their case place technology last year. Pretty awesome, they made it closed source, so nobody knows about that or how they do it. But we have a couple of good ideas and Wojtek and team already did a research on, on what is possible. Um, uh, the, the main red competitor is also doing that. Uh, some of you attended LinuxCon. They, they showed a demo which if you didn't work that well. So it's still it's still in engineering space. So user space live patching is a little bit more complicated because on one hand you need to also, I mean user space is a lot of applications, a lot of libraries. I mean you can start with glibc would be a, a perfect candidate, SSL maybe, those are candidates you want to do. But there are lots of other libraries there. So the kernel is one thing, but user space is pretty much complex. So this is a decision we need to make, which libraries make sense to patch, and of course the impact there. There are various models, it's on the agenda. And once we have the user space live patching, virtualization live patching would be automatically there as well, at least for KVM, because in KVM is mostly user space, and then it would be possible to also patch a hypervisor while the VMs are running, for example. In Xen, it's already there with version Xen 4.7. It is, uh, delivered with Service Pack 2, but um, for good reasons we disabled it in SP2. So the Xen community delivers live patching for Xen as a tech preview, and we decided, okay, if they call it tech preview, we as an enterprise distribution better not enable it right away. Maybe with Service Pack 3. So again, Service Pack 3 might be a target for Xen, and depending on how far we are with the user space live patching, again, 
we have an open position. So if any one of you knows someone, maybe your maybe your son, your your cousin is into coding, so um, you have the slides. You will uh, you can forward that to him or her. So and now we have the chance to win a three feet Susa plush chameleon. I don't have it with me because you need to do some things in order to earn that. The idea is that you try live patching because I can tell you lots of things here, how good a solution is and how awesome it is, but you only see it and, and, and understand the value if you use it. So what I have here is business cards from my, with my name and the registration key. And this registration key gives you the ability to use live patching for 60 days. I mean, you get this key also on our web page. So if you want to use live patching for 60 days, no guarantee that there will be a patch because if there's no security flaw, there will be no patch. But with this key, you enter a drawing for the plush chameleon. So mm -hmm. you, you should make sure to get one of these keys here. You need to register this key uh, on the SCC SUSE COM page. So if you have any SLES system up and running already, you probably already have an account. Just add this registration code to your account um, by December 31st, so by end of this year. Um, we, we track those keys, we have a list of those keys. We, we know which email address you use for registering. This is how we would contact you then, the drawing. I do the drawing via Twitter, my contact details are then on the next slide. So all you need to do is grab one of those business cards. I have 20 for this session and I have two more sessions. So it's, it's not only you entering the drawing, there are like up to 60 people entering the drawing for the plush chameleon. If you can't wait, you can buy one in a shop over there. But this is what you would need to do. And the drawing happens on February 28th. That's the, the drawing date. I will do that via Twitter. I will let everyone know via email because you need to register. So I have your email then um, about the drawing. And then the chameleon will go on a journey to the, the happy winner. And we pay, of course, the shipping costs. So, and course, very important. I need a selfie of the chameleon and the winner, which we will use then as an appetizer for <coughs> the next to the controlling. So after the session, we have those cards here. A couple of more references, um, maybe in, 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 an interesting read for you on the plane when you go back or you have time. Some facts about costs, like one hour of downtime cost one hundred thousand dollars and this is not just the cost of not doing business for one hour but also like opportunity costs your the loss of business I mean people engagement motivation have you ever was your email system once down in the company sometimes email system down and it's like all the people go in the hallway and say oh it's so great we have the best IT ever no that's not gonna happen everybody's bitching about IT and you can avoid those situations because that's a creates a bad mood and so on and so forth and it's also cost, that's company cost. Um, you have live patching for PowerPC we have there. There's a Forrester research paper, Linux versus Unix, hot patching they call it. Where Forrester thinks that we now have reached a tipping point where Linux finally caught up. I mean, you hear that like a couple of years already, for a couple of years. Linux is the new Unix, but this is just another thing where now Linux is ahead of, of the Unix. Um, and we have a YouTube video, how to patch an SAP HANA system with that. And having said that, I'm at the end of my presentation. I would like to thank Wojtek for helping me out on the, on the technical part. You can follow me on Twitter. Again, those are the, the keys you need. And before closing, I would like if, to ask you if there are any questions, because that's the last thing that stands between you and lunch, or you and the cards. Yes. Question, how to use a live with the Susa Manager? So the question was how to use live patching with the Susa Manager. We did a basic enablement with like for half a year already or a year. We have basic enablement so we can install manually the live patches with Susa Manager. Live patches are delivered via normal channels, regular channels. They are delivered as RPM packages. So Susa Manager can install them. But the notion within SUSE Manager about when the system needs a reboot, that has been introduced great lately. 
So because if a live patch is installed in a system, basically for a particular CVE, the system isn't vulnerable any longer. And then SUSE Manager should of course not give you a warning when you search for a CVE that you have to reboot that system because it is actually secure because you installed the live patch. And this has been released just recently. Or at least they are currently developing it. So I, I talked with the product manager, the team is currently developing that. It's going to be released very soon as a maintenance update for SUSE Manager 2.1 and 3. The other question I have is, uh, in, in, for example, right? Mm -hmm. They're saying which environment can be, which environment is not can be. So what's the limitation if you, if you put that way? Because my assumption, you can have live patch and you go over that. Why don't we do for all? In that case, you can reduce the uh, human power to resource for the project. Why not? We do one for all. Yeah, the question, the, the question was like, why not using live patching for all? Why to have a couple of examples? Um, talking to customers, it's like some some customers directly see, oh, that's a good fit for all for my entire environment, and they do it. But others say, no, I don't need that. And it definitely makes sense. I mean, from a if I can give it advice, go with every system because it helps you with every system that you need to have at least up and running without interruption. But you have the choice um, because sometimes it's like. There's a budget constraint. I mean, live patching doesn't come for free. The service costs something. It is priced like the HA extension, for example, at six ninety nine per socket pair dollars on the, on, the, on the US price list. And there are budget restrictions because, for example, to see if there are ten thousand servers, it's it, there's a substantial amount of money you have to pay for that. So you might come to a decision: Oh, I don't need that for ten thousand servers, but just for the one hundred most important servers. And those are the things that come into play because. It's like benefit versus the cost. And sometimes it makes sense in a certain environment that all the systems are going to be supplied with live patching and there are other environments where it doesn't make sense. Okay. Sure. All right. Then I will leave you. Thank you for your attention. Have a great rest of SUSECON. Thank you.